Well, we've been uh, doing a, a series here, off and on, for the last few weeks, um, called Great Women of the Bible. And of course, we have the opportunity to, to look at these great women of the Bible, but the great women of the Bible are the most important subject in our stories in seeing God at work through their lives. So we've talked about Deborah, we've talked about Ruth and Naomi, and uh, today we're going to talk about a lady by the name of Esther. And it's a fascinating story. It's one of those stories, kind of like the book of Ruth, that you can sit down and read it through from beginning to end. It's a story that will keep you captivated, but again, it's not just simply about a captivating story. There's a lot more there that we need to learn and know. But before Natalie comes up and reads Esther 4, I want to bring you up to where the story is at this time. And so, if you put your imaginations on, and you got to think about a long, long time ago, and there was a king. And his name was Xerxes. His name is also identified in some texts as Ahasuerus. But Xerxes is easier to say. So King Xerxes, Xerxes, and he had a vast empire. He had an empire that literally went at that time from Ethiopia, of which is probably uh, the modern day Sudan, if you can remember your African geography and went all the way to India. And there were 127 provinces. This was big. Now, Xerxes was a, a big king, a rich king, a king that wanted things to be about him because he, of course, was so important. And so the king, on occasion, threw a party. And when he threw a party, folks, it's not like you or I having a party at our house on Friday night that people might come at 6.30 and be gone by 10. No, the parties that this king uh, held lasted 180 days. Now, if you want to do that math in your head, that's six months. And the party oftentimes climaxed during the last seven days. And let me just say that these parties were not wholesome events. There was a lot of drinking of alcohol that was going on and a lot of behavior that was bad. And actually, when the king threw a banquet like this, there was typically three parties or banquets going on at the same time. There was one that was reserved for the VIPs, the very important people. They would probably be the ones hanging out with the king. They would be the ones who were leaders of the provinces, etc., and so on. Then there would be another party that was being held in the capital city. That was with just the regular people. That party became very wild. And then the third party that was going on was with all the wives. The women had their own party going on. So you got the VIPs, you got the whole capital party, and then you've got the wives over here all in one party. So it comes to the end of this party, these last seven days, and Xerxes, who's probably not sober at this time, wants to show off his incredibly beautiful wife, whose name was Queen Vashti. So Queen Vashti, of course, was at the party with the women, and the officials came to get Vashti, and Vashti was then to go and make an appearance at the king's party. Vashti was not the first strong-willed woman who's ever lived. But Vashti knew that if she went over to that party, that it was just a bunch of drunken men who were going to gawk at her. After all, Xerxes wasn't bringing her into his banquet to show off her cooking skills. She was beautiful, and he wanted all of his empire to see what a beautiful trophy wife he, in fact, had. And Queen Vashti did something that no woman would do at such a time. She said, no. That's right. She said, no, I'm not going. She declined that invitation. Well, no woman did that to her husband at that time. A matter of fact, it was so upsetting that the men all got together, these officials, around 
King Xerxes and said, Hey, wait a minute. If you can out that your wife can get away with saying no to you, that is going to spread all over, and women are going to be saying no to their husbands all the time. I could just see me start to think, oh, yeah, that's probably not going to be too good. So what did they do? Well, what King Xerxes, the only thing he could do is he basically banished Queen Vashti. You're done being the queen. You're out of here. Well, time goes on. There were some different things that happened in battle and stuff that separated the chapters there in the book of Esther. And then, of course, when things got all settled down, King Xerxes decided he wanted another wife. Now, he's a powerful king. He could have any woman that he wanted. But he wanted a wife. He wanted some companionship. And so what he decided to do is he decided that amongst this vast empire that he would hold a beauty contest. Kind of like the Miss Means and Persons beauty contest. It was going to be a pageant where women were sent from the pageant, from the provinces, and they would come in, and there would be a, a certain system that would have them appear before the king. And then ultimately, out of this contest, one would be chosen to be the queen. And so we have entered in, into our story a lady by the name of Esther. Her Hebrew name was Hadassah, and Hadassah actually means myrtle, a lovely shrub filled with fragrance. But her Persian name was Esther, and that means star. She had been orphaned and she was raised by a man by the name of Mordecai. She was beautiful. A matter of fact, the book of Esther talks about how these women, when they were actually going to go in to see the king, when they were basically going to go on display in front of him, they had all sorts of people there that would make up these ladies, get them all dolled up in the right dress and the right makeup and their hair and everything like that. I am so glad I'm not a woman for a variety of reasons. But you know, you have to do all that stuff. And, and sometimes, you know, ladies, when you were dating, usually it didn't take you longer to get ready than the actual date was. But these ladies, they took a while for them to get ready. But Esther said, you know what? I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this makeup and all this dolling up. And so she didn't take that. And she just went in as she was. And she won the contest. So let's look at Mordecai for a moment. Mordecai, he was the man who had adopted Esther. He's working at the city gate. While he's working at the city gate, of course, a lot of things come into the city gate. What is there? Now, Esther's already won the beauty contest. She's already with the king. And, of course, he hears a plot of some men who wanted to kill Xerxes. So he revealed that plot, got it into the messenger to Esther, and let Xerxes know of those people who were going to kill the king. And, of course, then that was foiled. They were punished. And nothing really happened to Mordecai. He wasn't elevated in any way. And whether or not his true identity was shown at that time, we're not sure. But then there was this other man by the name of Haman. Now, if we were doing a melodrama here, I would say every time I say the word Mordecai, I want you to clap. And every time I say the word Haman, I'd like you to hiss. Haman was not a good man. He was an evil man. And he was actually elevated at that time. He was given a large position in the king's administration. And the book of Esther describes him as an agagite. An agagite. You say, what in the world is an agagite? Well, really, it goes back to Canaan. Remember the Canaanites. Those were the people who the Lord gave over to his people and said, conquer these people, and I will give you their land. Canaan was an advocate, long-time enemies of God's people. Well, 
needless to say, Haman is really into himself, and as he gets a promotion, he becomes very important, and he's handling the king's business out there, and so he can do virtually whatever he wants. And so when Haman walks by, if you're there in the courtyard, you're supposed to, you're supposed to bow down to him, because he's really important. It's, it's Haman after all. So, Mordecai, he doesn't do that. Because see, Mordecai only bows his knee to one, and that's the Lord God. So needless to say, when Haman comes by Mordecai and he doesn't bow down, he gets tremendously angry. He's so mad at him. Now, Haman has the power. If he wants to take Mordecai out, he can just have him killed right there. But he doesn't do that. Because why stop at, uh, at Mordecai alone? Let's eliminate all of the Jews. All of them. It's amazing, folks, that throughout history, even to this very day, there are nations on the earth that want to take the Jews or the state of Israel and wipe it off the map. And that is, in fact, what Haman wants to do. To commit genocide. And so what he does is he ends up going to uh, a few of his friends and stuff, and they literally toss dice. Now, dice in the language of the day were poor, P-U-R. Maybe you've heard of the Jewish holiday, Purim, P-U-R-I-M, that's where this comes from. They rolled dice, and they figured out the date in which the Jews would be exterminated. Then, of course, he went into Xerxes. Now, you have to know, Xerxes probably wasn't always so sober. And he was the king, and so he left the running of his empire to others. So, Haman comes in and says, King, I will give you all these treasures. The king has plenty of treasures, but I'll give you all these treasures. I'd like to be able to the Jews throughout all the provinces that are out there. And the king said, fine, do whatever you like. I don't even need the money. Just go do whatever you like. He didn't care about the Jews. He didn't care about things. Fine, do what you want. Now the Jews have done nothing wrong. Yet, they When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off the sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, and the exact sum of money that he had been promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court, Without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the gold scepter so that he may live. 
But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these thirty days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews but from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told him to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast and eat you. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. see where we're at in the story. It's very tragic. You see, Esther was Jewish, but she didn't reveal that to anybody, including the king. Mordecai was out there, and he continued to follow the Lord and bring honor to the Lord. And, of course, he was ridiculed by that. One of the things that spurred Haman to do what Haman did. And so now we're kind of left in this cliffhanger of what is going to happen to the Jewish people. What role is Esther going to play in anything that happens, and what's going to happen with Mordecai? But before we go there, let me just talk about the book of Esther for a moment. Because the book of Esther is a rather unusual book. If you haven't read it, read it this afternoon. You know, one of the unique things about the book of Esther is the only book in the Bible that has no mention of the main word God in it. God isn't mentioned anywhere in the book. The king's name is mentioned 192 times, but never God. Prayer is never mentioned in the book. And it's unusual in this. There's only one other book in the Bible that is named after a woman, that being the book of Ruth. And now you have the book of Esther. We looked at Ruth a few weeks ago, and, if, and, in, and in the book of Ruth, there was a romance in there. And if the book of Ruth is a romance of redemption, perhaps we could call Esther a romance of God's providence. God's providence. You know, Esther's is an important book. Perhaps you remember the story of God's people in the Old Testament, because what happened is there came a time, and this was after King David, that there was Solomon, and then because there had been so much bloodshed and, and, and not following God in the way that you should, that the nation of Israel was split into two. And to the north, they became known as Israel, the same name. And then to the south, they were known as Judah. And then because of their ongoing disobedience, because God will punish ongoing disobedience, the northern kingdom, Israel, was taken captive by the evil and very powerful Assyrian Empire. God made that happen. It, did, it just didn't sort of happen. God made that happen. And it was about a hundred years later because Judah fell into sin as well, and they refused to repent of their sin. So God had the Babylonians capture Judah and take them into captivity. See, when I mentioned the word providence a moment ago, sometimes we're sitting here today and wondering, why is this happening? Why is that happening? Where is God? Is he on a siesta somewhere? Uh -uh -uh. God is working out a plan. The plan may not always seem convenient to you or me, but make no mistake, the writer of the story is God. And I'm sure that those in Israel were amazed that the Assyrians were taking them away. And I'm sure the people of Judah were amazed that God allowed the Babylonians to take them away. But make no mistake, this was all a part of God's providence. 
so then, as these people from Judah had been taken away, after 70 years, Cyrus, King Cyrus, who became king, said, you can go back. Now, 70 years was no coincidence, because there's no coincidences in the Bible. That was actually the amount of time that had been revealed to Daniel. Remember Daniel, the lion's den? That's how long the people would be in captivity. So they were allowed to go back then to their homeland. You know what? Everybody didn't go. Everybody didn't go back to their homeland at that time. Only some went back. As a matter of fact, less than 60,000 returned. And we know what happened to those people who returned because that's recorded in the books of the Bible, such as Ezra and Nehemiah. And then when you look at the prophetic books of Haggai and Zechariah. And so what we find out happening in the book of Esther was about the people who were everywhere else who didn't return to the homeland. So the book of Esther is very important. And the book, folks, is a lot about providence. It's a big theological term, providence. We probably don't talk about it enough. The providence of God. Listen to this. Providence is the means by which God directs all things. Say that again. It's the means by which God directs how many things? All things. Both in, uh, animate and inanimate. Seen and unseen. Good and evil. Towards a worthy purpose, which means His will will finally prevail. So God uses a variety of means to accomplish His will. They're not always convenient ways or ways that we even like. But His will will be accomplished. Another way of putting it, of which I think is in your outline, God is continually, constantly, and confidently at work. And folks, we need to remember this during especially the time that we're in. COVID-19, uncertainty in the United States, all sorts of tensions of the world. And we could start allowing fear to overtake us because we think, where is God? And we need to remember to repeat this line. God is continually, constantly, and confidently at work. Make no mistake about that. You see, even though we don't see the name of God, in the entire book of Esther, it doesn't mean that God was not working. A matter of fact, while God is God's absent, He is there. Sometimes in our own lives, we think that God is somehow invisible to the things that are going on, but we must always remember He is invincible. He is invincible. So we've already discussed just a little bit who are the main characters in the book of Esther. We have King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes. We have Queen Vashti. She's already been banished. We have Haman, the villain. We have Mordecai, the Jewish man living there in Persia, who was godly. And we have Esther, whose Jewish name was actually Hadassah. So, what is the rest of the story of Esther picking up from where Natalie just read a little bit ago? genocide that's about to happen to all the Jews throughout the entire empire. How many are we talking about? I just said a few moments ago, only about 60,000 returned to the homeland. There were 2 to 3 million Jewish people living throughout this empire. And here's Esther. You know, what a life. She's adopted by this godly man. She's being raised. They go in for a beauty contest. Somebody says that, you know, you probably would have been here. And he goes, and she's brought into that. She wins. She's literally living as the wife of the most powerful person in the world. You wonder if Esther, anywhere along in this story, asks this question. Why do you think this is all happening? Why am I here? Why did this happen to me? I mean, do you ever ask yourself the question, why am I living now, 2021? 
Why have I had the privilege of being born in the richest nation in the world, in the history of all time? Why? And behind that question, you have to know that God does have a purpose for you for such a time as this. I wonder if Esther might have asked that question. So, one of the rules was, you couldn't go and see the king unless you were invited. Even if you're his wife. Kind of crazy, isn't it? You got to be invited in. As a matter of fact, anybody who stepped into that area right around the king without an invitation would be put to death. This news comes to Esther about what's going on, and Esther's like, she's immediately thinking of the rules, and that's what we think about right away is the rules, the laws, and we got to follow these things. And that isn't going to work this time. There's going to have to be some risks that are going to be taken. Because something very, very, very terrible is about to happen. And of course, as she's brought that news, Mordecai sends word to her, perhaps, Esther, just perhaps, perhaps you're in there for such a time as this. Perhaps that's why you're alive. And that had to just agitate inside of Esther. Because she's not saying, seeing a way beyond the rules that she's subject to. And we can ask the question, surely, God, you wouldn't have me do something that big. I'm just a little person here. Amen. This isn't a story about Esther. This is a story about God. God always does extraordinary things through ordinary people, of which Esther was extremely ordinary. So she declares that they're going to have a fast. And then she declares she's going to go in. And here's what she said. And if I perish, I perish. Folks, I can translate that phrase in, in today's words to mean this. What do I have to lose? What do you have to lose to go out and live with God? What do you have to lose to be the witness that God has called you to be? What do you have to lose to do something that God calls you to that's extraordinary? You have your salvation. You have eternity with God in heaven. You think you're rich here? This is being a pauper compared to what's coming. He said, if I perish, I perish. And so now she was willing to take that risk. The king ultimately agrees to see Esther. And he is courteous to her. He likes her, maybe even loves her. And he shows real concern. He, he says a common phrase at that time, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And that was just a phrase that a king like that would use to say, I'm going to be very generous with you. And so what did Esther ask for? She says, I'd like to have a banquet. So he says, sure, let's, let's have a banquet. So she has a banquet. And uh, she has a banquet with the king. And uh, guess who she invited to the banquet? This guy by the name of Haman. Because she wants Haman there. She's found out some things about Haman. And they need to be revealed. So when the king uh, is there at this banquet, once again, he turns to Esther and says, What can I give to you? What can I do for you? And then you know what she said? I'd like to have another banquet. I'd like to have another banquet tomorrow. I'd like Haman to come tomorrow. And then truly, I'm going to answer your question. Now, you have to think about Haman for a moment. Haman, who's a very sinister, evil man, he is at the top of his world because he has now concocted this evil scheme to exterminate these people that he has long hated. And in the midst of that, he keeps getting invited to banquets with the king. And the queen is there as well. How could things get any better than this? Well, he's walking home from this banquet. And guess who he sees in the courtyard again? 
And Mordecai is no more willing to bow to him today than he was at any other time. And he is just had it. So he goes home to his place and gathers some things together. What are we going to do with this Mordecai? He's such a pain. So you know what they said as a loving wife turns to her husband and says, Kill him! That's an evil family, by the way. Build some gallows! Build some gallows! And then go get permission from the king. I mean, after all, if he's allowing you to kill the whole race, just have to get permission to, to, to kill Mordecai. And so... He thought, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. So they're going to build gallows. And, you know, in the history of the day, they're probably not gallows like we picture in our mind, like in the Wild West, where they have a big loose hanging down. It was probably way uglier than that. It was probably a big stake with a point on it in which they had killed the body. Ugly. So that's what they were, he was going to have that built for, for Mordecai to be killed on. And then, with that in mind, I've got the race that's going to be exterminated. I'm going to get rid of this Mordecai guy. Oh, oh I'm going to have a patient for a banquet. So he goes to the banquet. And so, what happens when he goes to the banquet is what I could describe as a twist in the story. And if we had to translate the word twist in the story, we would call that providence. God's providence. Huh. You know, it's interesting, before he gets to the banquet, the night before, when we go into the king's chambers, King Xerxes is able to sleep. Now, I don't know what you do when you can't sleep. Sometimes people get up and they maybe fix themselves a snack. Some people might get up and watch TV. Some people might get up and read a little bit. Whatever you do when you can't sleep at night. Well, when the king couldn't sleep at night, he's always got people waiting on him. And so he said, would you go get some of the history books of our history and read them to me? So they did. They called it the Book of Remembrance. And, and they're starting to read to him the Book of Remembrance because he can't sleep. I wonder why he couldn't sleep. Remember, this is Providence. So as they're reading him the Book of Remembrance, they come to the part where this man named Mordecai hmm, foiled a plot to assassinate the king. He comes to life a little bit. He says, hey, wait a minute. Did we ever do anything for that guy? Did we, I mean, did we ever do anything for Mordecai? I mean, he saved my life. And the officials around him said, no, no, we didn't. No, no, nothing was ever done for Mordecai. Well, that wasn't going to stay that way. And then all of a sudden, it's almost abruptly in the story, the king says, hey, who's down there in the court? Like somebody was going to come in. And they said, oh, it's Haman. Huh. Huh. So Haman's got the gallows built. He's coming to the banquet. Haman comes in, and he sits down just as proud as can be, and the king turns to him and says, Haman, if we were to honor somebody who is really, really important, what would you suggest we do? And Haman says, well, we should get this person the nicest robes possible, robes that even you have worn. Because guess who Haman thinks he's talking about? Him! Get these nice robes. And then what we should do is we should parade him around on horses. Horses, King, that you have ridden on. And then let's just, let's just revere him throughout the area and let everybody know how great he is. And the king thought, you know what, Haman? Those are all good ideas. Go do that for Mordecai. The oxygen just left the room. Guess what Haman did? Haman ran home, probably sucking both of his thumbs at the same time, went home to the rest, his wife, and said, you know what just happened? And he tells her the story. And she said, not good. This is not a good sign. And she knew that something else was up that would ultimately not only spell the demise of Haman, but spell the demise of their entire family. 
God's providence is at work. And so, what happened in that second banquet when it was held, Esther revealed what was going on. She revealed to the king that there was this plot to kill all of the Jews, of which she was one of those people, and that they were set to be exterminated throughout the land, two to three million people. And the word was already out there that this was going to happen on a specific day. Well, then when the king heard this from Esther, he said, who on earth could have put together a plan like this? So long story short, folks, the gallows that were created for Mordecai were now used for him. Mordecai was elevated and the Jews were saved. Now there's more details in the story than what I just communicated. You can read that on your own. But I want to just spend just a moment here now talking about the significance of the story, the significance of this woman and what we can learn from it. Who is Esther after all? Well, she's grace-filled. The fact that she pleased the king, that's what the book of Esther says, it says she pleased the king, literally could be translated, lifted up grace before his face. Lifted up grace before his face. We are called to be people who see grace and pass grace onto other people. Lift up grace before other people. That's what defined Esther. She was a grace-filled woman. You could be a grace-filled man, but you extend grace to other people. Lift up grace to others. Be kind to them. And of course, we're called to be that grace in this world to bring the good news of Jesus. She has a teachable spirit. She's in an entirely new environment that she's never been before. She held on to the things that were so important to her, mainly her devotion to God, but she was teachable. Mordecai kept teaching her. She kept learning. She could have become totally like the Persians, but no, she remained teachable under the tutelage of Mordecai. Folks, maintain a teachable spirit. A teachable spirit. You can learn new things about the Scriptures. That doesn't mean it alters your core beliefs about who God is and what He does in this world. But remain teachable. Esther is also modest. I don't believe that Esther really had any desire whatsoever to be the queen. She wasn't looking to get all painted up. She's just, she's just a modest, great girl. Selfless woman. And she is kind in spite of her surroundings. The book of Esther talks about how she's winning the favor of those people around her. She was pleasant, she was attractive, she was pleasing in every way. This was the type of woman, the type of person that she was. So, how did Esther become a hero? And, and how do we become a hero? You don't really ascribe to be a hero, but she actually became the heroine in this case of this story. Well, she received a huge challenge from a devoted friend. Perhaps you were brought into this royal position, Mordecai said, for such a time as this. Perhaps you are living and working and serving. Perhaps you are living working and serving at this time in 2021 for such a time as this. Esther was brought by God to be the queen. Esther was brought to this position to help spare God's people. Esther was brought here to this place to oppose an evil man. Esther was brought here to be a part of God's redemptive plan. Why are you here today? Why are you alive today? God has a purpose for you. God did not have you born at this time for no reason. 
God did not put you here to accumulate more wealth and buy toys. I'm just telling you, he didn't do that. That's not his purpose. Esther was finding out his purpose, and so must we. Let's be bold. Let's speak into people's lives. You know, when we see these kids up here, and we're challenging them to read the Bible, each one of them has a purpose. God has big plans for them. I would suggest God has big plans still for us who are out here. It takes me to the story of which we'll tell another time about Caleb, who I think was right about 80. And they needed to still do some fighting. And he said, put me in the front of line. I'm ready to go. Let's go. I trust God. We can do it. So whether you're 8 or 80, read your Bible and continue to live out the purpose that God has for you. Let's be bold. Let's be bold. Let's be courageous. And then God uses crises to help shape our faith. I think we could all get an amen to that. God uses crises. You know, if I had to ask everybody in this room, when did you grow the most in your faith? I bet a large portion of you would say, when this happened to me. And that this isn't always pleasant. Sometimes it's through an injury, an accident, a death, some sort of a tragedy. Something that you would cho- have chosen not to have, but it happened. And God often strengthens our faith under the umbrella of crisis. Because we sense at that time that no one else could go but to God. Matter of fact, James, the brother of Jesus, in, in his book in the New Testament, he says, Count it all joy. Count it all joy when these trials happen, when these troubles happen. Because in them, you are going to be grown and shaped and shaped. What did Esther do? She ultimately called for a fast, and then in faith she said, If I perish, I will perish. God strengthens us when we admit our weakness. Every, <laughs> there are times in our lives when we just have to jump. We just have to jump and trust the Lord. God strengthens us when we stop pretending that we are in charge, that we are the strong ones and the confident ones in and of ourselves. If I perish, I perish. You know, survival was not the primary goal. Sometimes that's what becomes our primary goal, survival. We oftentimes pray, Lord, keep us safe. And and I don't want to criticize that prayer, but certainly we have people throughout the Bible who weren't kept safe. Certainly we have people in the history of Christianity who weren't always safe. Here's where we need to find our safety. In the army. I perish. I perish. See, what happened in Esther's life needs to happen in our life. Her worst case scenario was not death. Her worst case scenario became disobedience. You have to remember that. God strengthened us. He strengthens us when we risk to obey. We must take the first step. God has a calling on our life. You have come to this moment in time, and it is not for nothing. You may think, you may think you have a trajectory for your life. College students that are here, you may think you have a trajectory for your life, that you've got everything lined up. I go to college, I get married, I get a job, I have kids, and I pay for my house. It doesn't always work that way. God may have other plans. I love talking to missionaries and how they ended up somewhere on the remote parts of the world, on the island of Boca Boca, wherever that is. Did you plan this? No, we really didn't plan this. I didn't plan to be in Palo Iowa. So many people think they have the trajectories, but when we open ourselves up to God, God comes in, intervenes, and puts us on His trajectory. And our mandate is to do one thing, and that is to obey. So let me close with this. Not until we believe that one person can make a difference in 
but we just keep looking for paper lists. One person can make a difference. You can make a difference. And when you understand that you can make a difference, you can take that step, then you're willing to take a risk for God and to do something. Quit being careful about protecting yourself. Take a risk and watch how God gives you wisdom and courage. And then move from thought to reality and make a difference. So this morning we're telling our kids, read the Bible. Get this into you. Get this truth into you. Amen, amen, amen. People of God that are sitting here, get the Bible into you. Read it. Study it. Memorize it. Meditate on it. But remember, thought about Christ isn't the end. It's what you have done, what you have done about what you think about Christ that's important. What you're doing about what you think about Christ. Don't just stop at thought. All you then become is a fat head. It's what you do, what you think about Christ that's important. God wants warriors like Esther. I found this out this week. I find this interesting. Let me close with this. That's my third close. Lions and tigers, you've heard of them. Do you know that if a lion would fight a tiger, do you know who wins? Do you know who wins? Tiger, thank you. Thank you. It's interesting that both of these play in Detroit. And they're both losers. <laughs> that has nothing to do with the story. When a lion and tiger fights, a tiger will win. But when ten lions face ten tigers, who wins? The lions win. Why? Because tigers fight alone. Lions fight them in the crowd. So here's my challenge. Fight like a tiger with the mentality of a lion. Go out there and fight like a tiger with the mentality of a lion. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bless your name and we thank you, Lord, that we can read this story about Esther, this story that's incredibly real. It happened. And we're inspired because of this ordinary woman who happened to be very beautiful, was created for such a time that she was in, and she was used by you literally to save a baby. Lord, we know that you have a purpose on each of our lives. And we're all sitting here today, Lord, and we're extremely ordinary people. But you, as an extraordinary God, can do extraordinary things to just a bunch of ordinary people. So I pray, Lord, that we'd be willing to take those risks, that we would embrace the words that Esther said, if I said it to her, that we would trust you. Because in the end, Lord, it's all going to work out for you. Thank you, Christ, thank you, Christ.